you have a question. Right, we've got Hazel's got a question and Debbie. So oh. if we go with Hazel first, because I saw her waving her arm first. Right, I finished Christmas pie last night. Um, did I have a page missing? Now we're supposed to guess who Sykes picked. <laughs> No, it finishes off with the door opening. You are not yes. missing a page. All right. <laughs> I thought, I'm, I'm in my mind. I'm guessing who she picked. No, but... <laughs> I'm. I'm really sorry. That's my crawl streak coming through. You know, everybody else is dripping with Christmas good cheer and benevolence and goodwill to all men, and I do that to my readers. It, it, I enjoyed the story because with the Edward and, and uh, Richard business, we kind of got in our mind, our opinion of the whole thing, you know. So I was I was happy with the short story. I had to read it in two lumps because Christmas got in the way. But, you know, oh, it was great. No! Yes, yes, I know it did, didn't it? Um, yes, did definitely. anybody, can I ask a question of my own? Did anybody complete the challenge? Is there anybody out there who actually ate 26 mince pies? No. Make yourself known now. No, no, I think I only managed no. about eight. <laughs> Lightweights, all of you. I'm actually sick of mince pies at the moment, to be honest. So, you know, <laughs> I start at the beginning of during November and now I've had enough. But anyway, it was good. He enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you <laughs> Thank very you. much. Debbie, you had a question next. Debbie, you've got oh, to unmute. Oh, yes, yes. Oh. I wasn't feeling very Christmassy. Well, I was. I. This isn't necessarily about the book. It's about all the books, really. I... I um I I came to your books and St Mary's books years years ago and I raved about them to everybody that I talked to and nobody would take any notice of me so as soon as I mentioned time travel or big ginger horses people just sort of switched you could see their eyes glazing over and, they glaze don't they yeah yeah and, and so that happened to me however this Christmas suddenly last year several people that I know have started reading them and I feel and then they started talking to me about the characters now I love it in St Mary's world in this world Jodie world it's just wonderful sharing this with everybody but sharing it in my real world is a completely weird experience and talking to people that I know about the books and then being familiar with the characters was really weird and I don't like it and I was just wondering from your point of view, when you had all these in your characters in your head and you were writing the stories, how does it feel to share the stories with the world and suddenly realise other people are engaged with your characters in the same way? Because I don't like it. And then, it, it, my was a little, it was a little bit difficult um, to begin with because I started writing when I was out in Turkey Um so I didn't have any family around me um, and I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. I don't know why. I just didn't. Um, and I th I think I wrote four. Or I, I wrote two or three books before I told my family um, and I just kept it to myself. And then I moved back to this country. And of course, nobody knew me where I'm living now um so again i kept it all to myself um i don't know if i'm naturally secretive i find it very difficult to talk about my books directly to people i did once have a lovely lady stop me in the street and squeak oh my god you're jody taylor <laughs> so having established i didn't owe her any money i put my hand up to it and said yes yes i am mm -hmm. um it's and people would say to me, well, what's your day, books right? about? And I'm yeah. such an idiot. Um, I say things like, oh, well, um, it, it's about, the, but you have to remember that years before, and then before that stuff. happened, this happened. And before I know what I've done, I've burbled on incoherently for about 25 minutes and not told anybody anything. Um, and I actually ran a masterclass once, and one of the subjects we talked about was 
talking about your book because you have to sell your book to people. So we all had an exercise where we wrote a short blurb of a couple of hundred words and then a longer blurb. And the short blurb was for if you're at a party or in the pub and somebody says to you, oh, you've written a book. What's it about? You could learn a couple of sentences that put the idea across without you looking a complete imbecile and then if they just wandered off at that point no harm done but if they actually said oh that sounds interesting then you could go in with the slightly longer blurb in a little bit more detail and having done that eight or nine times I'm now more comfortable talking about my books than I certainly was 10 years ago when I started out it's not easy I don't know if we're brought up to be modest whether it's because I'm of an age of modest females yeah look how that worked out whether women were brought up to be modest about their achievements whether it's an age thing whether I'm just naturally odd I don't know 10 years of practice and Hazel standing threateningly over me with the electrodes has considerably improved my performance, I have to say. Thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Can I have another hand up, please? Oh, female. You have to unmute. Hey, Jodie. Right, Steve, Hello. yesterday, thanks to the convention, I started reading your book, listening to your books. And it was on one yesterday after a call out, driving home, came in and went, it's your fault. And we need a warning, naked gardening. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, I hope he wasn't speeding at the time. <laughs> yeah, he was listening because they're all unaudible. When he's in his car, and it was naked gardening, it was on the motorway at the time. He was like, "Bleed now, I nearly crashed my car." <laughs> oh, so nice one, Jody. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I've got to say that was one of the the fun bits to write. It was. It was. Absolutely I didn't realise naked gardening was a real thing. I think I saw something somewhere, and it started to train the thought in my mind. And I think the first thing I thought well, was, well, that's a novel way to eradicate green fly. Um, <laughs> and then I thought, well, you know, we've got to bring St. Mary's into this. Um, you know, the dangers of pruning roses too enthusiastically. Um, and and it, the scene just unfolded in front of me. And I think I wrote the whole thing in about 15 minutes. Um, oh, and nice it's one. absolutely nothing to do with the story at all. But it was such fun to write that I just couldn't resist yeah. it. I have no willpower. <laughs> nice one, Jodie. <laughs> You're welcome. I have a question for you, Jodie. Um, horses and ponies um, and donkeys. Have you much experience of them? Because the way you sort of tidy their forelock and everything, I mean, I've... I've I'm allergic to them, so unfortunately I can't go anywhere near the bloody things. But I'm just fascinated why you suddenly came up with this golden horse, invisible golden horse, that appears to fit in the car and and yeah. in the corner of the bedroom and everywhere else. Yeah. How did you come up with that idea? I honestly don't know where the idea of Thomas came from she there were there was going to be the voices but I wanted to make it a tangible presence and initially I thought along the lines of handsome young man um and then I thought I, I don't know where horse came from but I, I settled on horse and not just any horse in that case he had to be giant and invisible and golden and and you know because if you're going to have a, a horse then you know go the whole hog and make it completely unbelievable um I used to ride a lot when I was younger and much more flexible than I am now um, and it's one of the few things that I'm actually quite good at I really enjoyed riding um, but horses got the better of me time after time and I've been bitten kicked I've been rolled on and I was once the sandwich between two fornicating horses and that was no fun at all I had to be rescued um, I've been crushed um, I've been run away with I've had a horse run into a tree and sweep me off with the branch 
Um, so I suppose really describing all these horses, you know, Turk and his bloody mindedness and little Marilyn who eats everything in sight is my revenge on the horse world for giving me such a hard time between the ages of 10 and 16. Um, it's a miracle I survived and I do actually have two deformed toes where a horse trod on them and I think I must have broken them and of course, you know, just ignored it as as you know you tend to do um so i have these weird shaped toes um but i'm still despite that very fond of horses um and i'd love to ride again but sadly my back is not up to it and i can't do it which is very sad so i take out my horse love on paper now Sharon, Wait, just when you... Sharon Clint, officer clint's got the question for you oh, it's... hello sharon Hello there, Jodie. How are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. And you? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Um, so, uh, you wrote an absolutely beautiful character, I felt, in Kevin. Can I just ask what prompted you to write somebody who is experiencing homelessness? Yeah, actually, um, I looked out of the window one day and there was a young lad. Um, I've no idea how old he was. I don't think he was 18, but um, a young lad was walking past my window mm -hmm. and he had a giant flattened cardboard box. Um, and it was long before the days of giant televisions. So I don't know what he'd had in this box, a washing machine or something maybe. And he was probably just taking it to, because there are public tips in Turkey at the end of every street. And he was probably just taking it there. And I watched him walk past. And I know from experience that the ground is very hard and cold to sleep on. And I'm sure I read somewhere that homeless people value giant cardboard boxes because they're warm to sleep on and you can flatten them out and, and sleep on them. And they're fairly robust as well and they keep you out of the wet. And I just started thinking about that. And then I thought about... Um, the most inept mugger everywhere, hiding behind the bins, behind the post office, trying to psych himself up um, to do this um, and getting Russell of all people. I mean, how unlucky as a mugger could you be? Um, and the whole thing just kind of cascaded. Um, from there and then of course I wanted to give him a girlfriend so there was the lovely Sharon um, and he catches sight of her and walks straight into the water trough <laughs> you know because he's cool and sophisticated yeah so cool so yeah Kevin was lovely I enjoyed writing uh, Kevin he's just he's one of my favorite characters for sure well thank you thank just, you and the empathy around him I think is is what what endears me to that storyline like, well Yes, and the fact that um, his mum didn't want him when she got a boyfriend, um, mm. it didn't resonate with me, but I thought, oh, you know, poor lad. Um, so I wrote this kind of tragic figure um, who found himself in exactly the right place for him yeah. to be. Um, yeah. And that was the turning point for his life. Um, I'm not sure what's become of him after the something girl but I feel sure that he will go on and make a big success of his life really Do absolutely what's happened to him <laughs> I don't know give us a chance <laughs> fantastic thanks so much you're welcome Marianne's got her hand up and Debbie had her hand up should we go to Marianne and then come back to Debbie? Thanks, Karen. So, okay. So first a comment and then a quick question. The comment is, um, this is going to be like totally out there, but I read uh, The Nothing Girl of 2020 and it was November, 2020 during the height of COVID before vaccines and everything. And at the time, my mom had had a massive stroke and was in hospice. So they allowed one person in at a time to sit with her. So I was sitting vigil by my mom in hospice, knowing she was going to pass within the week and read all of the books back to back to back. And the nothing girl 
got me through that. I mean, it was the message of hope and sort of light at the end of the tunnel and you can go through dark days and come out of it that I just needed. It was just like fate. I was just like, oh, read all St. Mary's. I've read this, I've read that. Let me try the nothing girl. And so I, I just want to thank you. I mean, it just meant, I mean, it really got me through a really, really dark period of my life. Um, well, but, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm glad I did. But now my question. So reading, you know, we're going, we jumped from St. Mary's to Elizabeth Cage to the nothing girl. So is Thirsk in your mind, the same Thirsk in every series i mean i did see i do remember the mention of the bridge uh, like going over like a bridge into the town or the village or whatever in both elizabeth cage and um the nothing girl but when you like when you're writing do you, is it the same thirst <laughs> I mean, or... yes it is the same thirst um i was living in um uh, i used to live in north allerton which is just up the road from Thirsk. I think it's about eight or nine miles away. Um, and the reason there is the University of Thirsk um, and so forth is because I simply couldn't be bothered to keep typing North Allerton. It's such a long word. <laughs> Whereas Thirsk was much shorter. For God's sake, don't tell North Allerton. They'll lynch me. <laughs> Brilliant. But interestingly, the... Rushford, which is loosely based on North Hallerton. The Rushford in The Nothing Girl is North Hallerton. The Rushford in St. Mary's is, sorry, the Rushford in Elizabeth Cage is Shrewsbury. And I'm not sure what the Rushford in um, St Mary's is it's a kind of amalgamation of them but as I'm picturing the scenes as I'm writing them I've suddenly realized that I've got different Rushfords the scene in the nothing girl that takes place outside boots where Jenny's trying to hide her face because it looks as if Russell's been knocking her about um took place in my mind outside boots in North Allerton simply because the pavement there is quite wide and there would be enough room for such a drama to take place. Um, that's that's the only reason why. Um, but it's interesting when I describe the Rushford of Elizabeth Cage, it's always Shrewsbury that I see with the English bridge on one side and um, Wild Cop, I think it's called, the hill going up with the bunch of grapes on one side and the market square at the top, um, which is not the same as North Allerton at all, which is quite a flat town. Um, and I don't know how this came about. I suspect undisciplined thinking is the cause of all my problems, as my teachers at school always told me it would be. Thanks. Oh, and, and I have to say, your, your description of an off-the-track thoroughbred is so spot on with its neuroses. <laughs> so, I'm like, because my son rides one. And I like, when I read that, I was hysterical. I was like, oh my God, she has to ride because this is yeah. so spot on. The, well, off the track. One of the riding schools I used to ride at, um, one of the instructors there had an ex race horse. And this thing was the most beautiful horse you've ever seen in your life. And it had two brain cells and it was terrified of absolutely everything. Um, there were about three days a year when it would venture outside because otherwise it was too hot, too cold, too wet, too windy, whatever. Um, and it was terrified of leaves, telegraph poles, gates, water troughs, cats, dogs. The, there was um, a water trough and they kept goldfish in the water trough and it wouldn't drink from the water trough because it was obviously terrified that a goldfish would leap up and do the crocodile with the wildebeest thing that we've all seen on the nature programs um, and as I say he was a lovely horse and he was very very gentle and wonderfully good looking but seriously that horse had personality problems um, and that's where I got boxer from yeah, well, it's it's my son's horse is very similar. I'm fond of saying that he like sees dead people. 
because he's just kind of randomly going along and then out of the blue he spooks and goes nuts and I'm like yes the horse sees dead people so yeah yeah they're so pampered I think that's what it is that they're they're completely unable to cope with the real world yes. yeah yeah so thank you you're welcome Debbie Allred hi oh so am I on yeah just a couple of comments really just just you know, when you said you made up, of course you made up, Thomas, but what works for me, works. it just feels like it's always been there. Or it shouldn't be, it's not a, it's, don't know how to describe it, but it feels real. I didn't not, wake up one morning and think, I'm going to write about an invisible golden horse. <laughs> yeah, I had the character of Jenny and, and she needed this guiding voice. And, and I kind of oscillated between invisible voices handsome young men, all sorts of things. And I didn't one day think it's going to be a horse, but I can't really remember a time when it wasn't going to be a horse, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. I yeah, don't have, really... have huge light bulb moments or anything mm. like that. I think, you know, I see something, it triggers an idea and it things evolve from that. Right, thank you. And just... I think what's beautiful about the story is it's lots of broken people all supporting each other and, and broken people and broken animals and everybody's misfit somehow creates something beautiful. And they all fit together at the end, don't they? Yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. lovely, lovely community. Oh, thank so, you. It was great fun to write, I have to say. Um, I didn't have any clear idea of the story when I started out. Um, and that's one of the stories that evolved as I was writing it, especially the scene where Marilyn's owner turns up and wants her back. Um, and I thought, this is the moment where Jenny suddenly finds that she can not only cope with the world, she can cope with an unpleasant world and she can do it well. Mm, of course, yeah. she goes to pieces afterwards because that's quite normal. Um, but yeah, that is one of the turning points for her. Yeah, I love that. I love that um, fact that you, you you know I've got to make my own strength, do, do this, use my own skills to deal yes. with that situation and that's that's not I can't be a Russell I can't be anybody else I can be myself I know I found that was quite impairing I really enjoyed that and I kind of take that away with myself as well be Thank more confident you. in kind of being myself and developing my own way of dealing with things yeah I I wanted her first thought to be Russell must deal with this. I can't deal with this. Like, I can't talk on the telephone. I can't do this. But Russell's not there. And she realizes that if she doesn't step in and do something, this guy will take Marilyn back. And therefore, she has to do something. Um, and it was very important that she made the transition from why isn't Russell here to deal with this to I must deal with this and I can deal with this. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, really loved it. And the the um the uh, I listened to stories on audiobook, and the I can't remember what her name was, but she was brilliant. Lucy. She Lucy. just fitted Jenny just so well. I thought she emailed me afterwards. Um, two things she had to say. First was that bloody donkey and making Marilyn's <laughs> brain. She said her tonsils were never the same again. And the second thing she wanted to say was the scene where Thomas leaves. She, both she and her producer cried so much, they had to stop recording for half an hour oh. and go off and have a cup of tea and pull themselves together. Oh, that's um, lovely. And I, I wrote and thanked her and said how nice that was. And then because I'm evil, when I wrote The Something Girl, I invented the Patagonian attack chickens and the rooster just for her. And I wrote to her and said, hello, Lucy, how lovely to speak to you again. Start practicing your rooster noises. Um, so I'm not sure how popular I am among voice artists, actually. Well, it makes it very popular with us. We love the Patagonian attack chickens. I'm following so many chickens on Instagram at the moment just because of Throckmorton. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sadly sharing a lot of them on the group. I'm trying, I'm trying to hold myself back now. from. <laughs> but I'm loving it. <laughs> so, chicken fetishist then. <laughs> yeah.
Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. We've got loads coming in now. Uh, I've got. I know Keith Jackson wants a question and I know Sharon wants a question and I know Mo wants to ask a question. But prior to all of those, Carol M has asked, she's only just got into the audio Frog Morton and Cage series and realises they're set in the same time. So if Elizabeth Cage bumped into Russell and Jenny, she wonders what colours they'd see, that she'd see from Russell and Jenny. Oh, interesting. I think Russell's colour, I'm not sure what it would be. I'd have to have a think about that, but I can see the movement. Um, it would be like, I think a bit like Quicksilver. It would be very fast, in and out, always moving like he is, never still, very restless um, and possibly quite sparkly. Jenny, I think, would be a more muted colour, um, possibly like her name, a soft dove browny grey colour, um, very deep and very rich. Um, yeah, I think that would work. Yeah, I'd go with that, actually. That's brilliant. I love that. Uh, Keith Jackson, go on, Keith, and then we'll come back to Sharon. <laughs> Hi, Jodie. Um, Hi. It's a quickie. It's more about uh, your the way you write. Um, I once worked with a guy who was trying to write a book and he, or he, he'd had several goes, and he always said that he couldn't write without knowing where he was going. He needed a destination and then he wrote from there to it. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas other people that I've, I've spoken to, they sort of start and just end up where they end up. Are you either of those or somewhere in between? Um, for preference, I like to know the end. I like to know where I'm going and then all I've got to do is is get there and it doesn't matter how much I meander on the way I know where I'm going um I don't think I've ever got two-thirds of the way through a story without knowing how it's going to end um I have started stories I have really known where it's going to end but it makes me very uneasy the ending is my security blanket I may not know how it's going to begin um quite often I don't write the ending until a good halfway through when I know the characters better because there's no rule that says you have to write your book chronologically you don't have to start at the beginning and work through to the end um and when I'm really stuck if I've got an idea of how I want the story to go, I'll choose a good, strong scene in the middle of the book and write that. And then from there, I can carry on with what happened after that and then after that and after that. Or if I'm feeling flamboyant, I can go backwards. How did they work up to that scene? What happened before? What happened before that what happened before that? And in this way, I can move up and down the book according to how I'm feeling at the time um because sometimes i'm writing one scene and thinking about another and sadly i'm at the age where if i don't write something down immediately it's just gone forever you know who am i where am i going why am i in the bathroom apart from the obvious um so i move around the book um, and sometimes and i have done this i write a series of scenes and then stitch them together and that's particularly effective in short stories when you don't have to worry about character um, chapter structure so i hope that answers your question a little bit Next, we've got Officer Clint again. <laughs> I'm never living this down, am I? Um, no, you're not. No. Nah. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a kind of like people wide question, but definitely want to know from you, Jody. And it's also something because maybe I'm just a little bit loopy. But I've got one favorite word. Like of all of the words that you put on paper, I have one that's a favorite based on the way that both. Lucy and Zara tend to say it for all characters and that's what it's like the, <laughs> am I wrong like every single character says what exactly the same like they they all have that kind of uh, I don't know there's like a 
Ugh. It's such a useful word. You can it's say useful. it in so many ways. You can say what or yeah. what. Um, or, but so often you know, your characters be, are it, incredulous. It can be threatening. It can be inquiring. It can be yeah. anything. It's a really useful word, actually. And it's very short to type, too. Of course. But have you noticed that both of them say that word almost identical? Um, Especially with the female characters. It's such a short word. I'm not sure there are that many ways to <laughs> sell it. <laughs> um, as I said, Maybe you know, I there's the really interrogative good. or the angry or the puzzled or, or mm -hmm. whatever. I think a lot of it is is me, actually. I tend to say what a lot. I like to think David Tennant modelled his style on me. <laughs> Very good. Maybe. Anyone else here with David Tennant? Well done, David. <laughs> Right, next we've got Susan Hellman who had a question for you. Uh, well, I I was thinking about, I was wondering about, since you have all of these stories in your head and you have this pleasure of sitting down and, and, and writing them and getting them out of your head onto paper, I was wondering if that was something that happened all your life. You had talked about, you always mentioned that your teachers complained that you daydreamed in class. But then I also have a more cheeky little question, since we were talking about chickens, and since you told us about your horse riding experience, is, is um, oh shoot, what's his name? Is, I can't think of his name now because I'm about to turn 61. It starts with an A, Angus. Is Angus based on a real character in life? A real no, life? I made Angus, Angus up. Okay. Um, Ang Angus was originally going to be a human being, and then I wrote the scene and thought, wouldn't it be funny if Angus was a chicken? I don't know where these thoughts come from. Please don't ask. So when I wrote the scene, Angus was a human being, but when I got to the punchline at the end, Angus was a chicken. It's all very, very well for us. That I'm not complaining at all. It's great. And, and I don't know where the word Angus came from either, but there we go. <laughs> well, and and my other my more serious question. Was this something that happened throughout your life? Because I, I heard from another author that she was telling her sister stories at night while they were growing up. Is, did, did you share the story? No, you didn't share your stories? No, it's th this, this might be a, a longish response, um, but I got into such trouble at school writing stories. Um, I was educated in the um, 50s and 60s um, when education was considerably more rigid than it is today. Um, and I can remember I was in the second year at junior school, so I must have been eight or nine. And I was writing a story actually about a donkey that was being rescued. So you see, I haven't moved on from it at all. Um, and the teacher came round and, and took my book off me and read what I'd written so far and was absolutely incensed by my use of slang terms. Um, and we wrote in pencil in those days um, and she tried to rub it out with her rubber and she was so cross and so angry and rubbing so hard that she creased the page up. And in temper, she seized my book and ripped out all the pages and tore up my story and threw it away. Um, and you learn from that sort of thing. Um, and then I got to secondary school and I was commanded to enter the school poetry competition because it was a girls school. Mm -hmm. I was handed subjects suitable to have poems written about them, um, such as moonlight and puppies and daffodils and clouds and that sort of thing. And I wrote about cannibalism um, and she was not best pleased. Um, and I got my book back with a great red line. In fact, the pen had gone through the page and the words see me snarled across the bottom. <laughs> I was in detention just about for the rest of the term. I um, and from, it. from that point, um, I really stopped writing because it got you into such trouble. And then when I got into local government, I tried to enliven my memos a little bit because this was pre-computer. Um, so I put in little jokes and puns in the memos and, and that didn't go down at all well either. So until I actually retired, um, I had no thought of writing anything at all because it got you into such trouble. 
Well, I'm so sorry to hear that. I do remember your story about cannibalism. Oh, I'm I, sorry. Did I bore you? No, I just want to tell you that you might feel that things have moved on because in 1980, which was when I was in the next to last, uh, let's call it fifth form, I actually won the school's poetry prize. And I was very, very embarrassed because at the ceremony, they read the entire poem out loud. And the poem was actually about menstruation and menstrual cramps. Great. Well, I wish I'd thought of that. Well, you know, the poem was titled To Jay because of my friend Jez, um, fellow sufferer. <laughs> No, I wish I'd thought of that, actually. That might have been even more effective than cannibalism, <laughs> although cannibalism... <laughs> I suppose I was lucky the educational psychologist wasn't visiting that week. Well, were you pro or con for cannibalism? Oh, it was... Um... It was a wonderful piece um, describing not only the cannibal village, but the cooking process. Um, I can still remember bits of it. Um, <laughs> and I, with hindsight, it probably wasn't the best subject. But, but what about telling stories? I mean, just orally, p passing on things to friends or joking around with friends. Well, I was never given to understand that the stories that I was telling or thinking were particularly acceptable. Um, in, in those days, this sounds terrible, but it was very much a what I did in my holidays style of essay writing. Um, there wasn't a lot of flexibility, especially if you were at an all girls school. You know, there were subjects that definitely should and should not be mentioned. Um, and of course, you know what kids are like. You've only got to tell them that there's nothing they mustn't talk about and they don't <laughs> shut up for three days, do they? That's true. <laughs> but before anybody feels too sorry for me, I do suspect I was a bit of a troublemaker. Apparently, there are leaders, which are good things, and there are ringleaders, which are not. <laughs> well, well, I've got a queue. Very well for us, for your readers. <laughs> I've got a queue of questions for you now, because um, there's loads of people. Hazel, I've spotted you. You're next on the list after I've got through all the people before you. So next, it's Janice. Janice had a question. Right. Thank you. Hi, Jodie. Going Hi. back to Christmas pie and disregarding the amount of, Chris of mince pies we had to eat while spotting words, I love the way you rounded up things for um, Mal Malcolm. That was really lovely. And I remember you. we had another time traveller there, another um, recovery agent or bounty hunter, and he'd been mentioned in one of the previous books. And because I've read a few waiting for the chat, I read the last one in the St. Mary's and the last one in Time Police, and I can't remember which one he was mentioned in. But once you'd written his name down, did he then bug you so that you had to bring him into another book? Oh, yes. He makes um, quite a large appearance in the Ballad of Small Hope and Penny Royal. Oh, right. <laughs> you will be seeing more of him. I can remember his name because I, I shouldn't have read so many books waiting. <laughs> I can tell you if you want, or shall yes, I not right. do spoilers? No, it's okay, I'll read it again. Okay. <laughs> uh, I've got one from Carol, who said she read Long Shadows alongside Nothing Go. I did that as well. So she's got a question regarding Long Shadows. Did you have the painting The Nightmare by Heinrich Fuseli, if I've pronounced that correctly, when writing the ghost demon scene? No, no, I didn't, actually. Um, the ghost demon scene is something that's been with me for a long time in my head. Um, God, I hope there are no psychological professionals out there. Um, it's just a scene that I've had, um, and it just, and, and I wrote most of Long Shadows around that seems so that I could bring it in. Um, but no, I didn't do that. It all came out of my head, I'm afraid. I've got a comment from Nick, who we all know as Joe Tetzer, who says he, 
<laughs> I can see you hiding there behind your bottle of beer. You can't see me because <laughs> I'm invisible. Um, he loves how open and honest you are about your writing process. Um, and then we've got another one from Debbie Allred, who's got another question, followed by Hazel. Hi, sorry, this is just a quickie. Just a smart from what you were saying, really, was that you, you write so nothing goes so much joy in it. And I was just wondering with your writing, is it just brilliant just to not have to do historical research for this one? You just be able to make it up? Yeah, yes, actually, it, it was. And when I'm writing St Mary's, I am surrounded by reference material. Um, and it's lovely to write something contemporary where apart from looking up the eating habits of donkeys and how to care <laughs> for horses' feet and all that sort of thing, I can just go along and know that nobody's going to criticise me because I've described a door wrongly for the period or something like that. So, yes, it's a bit of a holiday for me. Right. Thank you. I think it comes across in the feeling of it as well. Yeah. Just thinking uh, about it. Yeah. There's a certain amount of joie de vivre. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hazel. Hazel. Sorry. <laughs> Joe's just put, I'm not behind a beer bottle, just ugly. <laughs> I'm is, sure this... I saw a beer bottle there just now or some sort of bottle. <laughs> But anyway, um, um, Hazel's yeah. next. Jodie, after reading the first two cage, I thought I had to read the third one. And what you were saying to Keith about needing to know your ending, did you always plan for um, Elizabeth to turn out to be well, a god? You know, so it was such a ending of the third book after the first one built up and the second one. But the third one was... Wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I think in the first everything. book, I, I do say um, she does refer to the thing inside her head telling mm. her to do this or do that or, or do the other. I wasn't quite sure which direction it was going to go in because, you know, this is me and the words plan ahead just don't apply at all. Um, and then I elaborated a little bit in the second book um, and then it, I thought by the third book, I should be starting to pin this down a little bit. So, yes, the, the idea was always there. I just developed it more in the third book. Uh, it was fascinating. And obviously, you had the wow factor. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> uh, we've then got, hold on, Glynis is next. I'm trying to get to you all in order. Glynis is next. Hello. Um, I don't have a question. I just want to share some things. Um, Jody, it's, thank you so much. And what an honor it is to be able to actually talk to an author that you love. You know, most authors are, you know, spirits off in Neverland that you never really get to talk to. So this is so cool. Obviously, this is my first time on this chat. I discovered St. Mary's at the end of November, and I can't read them fast enough. I have never had a series capture me the way this series has. The first one, I read it so fast because I couldn't wait to see what happened that when I finished it, I opened it and started it over again so I could read it more slowly and appreciate it and enjoy it and enjoy the nuances that you have in there. So I, I'm up to Plan for the Worst, which is number 11, and I'm reading all the short stories in between too. And like I said, I just, I just can't read them fast enough. And the way they've affected me is one... I am now drinking a lot more tea than I ever did. So I'm drinking tea. And just this morning when I had a little situation that I had to resolve, I actually said in my head, I need to sit down and have a think. <laughs> so that's how your books have impacted me. And I'm telling all my friends about them. And I've got several who have started reading them as well. So just, you know, thank you. I can't wait to start reading the other books as well. So. That's that all. is very kind of you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your sense. I, I've, I've laughed out loud. I can't tell you how many times um, reading these books and I've cried too. And like I said, there's, I can't read them fast enough. I had a whole stack of Christmas books to read in December and I haven't touched them because I have to keep going. I have to keep you going know, with my I, memories. So I say uh, this all the time, six months to write 
six hours to read. Come on, guys, give me a break. <laughs> well, my my plan when I finish, um, I guess Christmas Pie will be the last short story at the end of the series. My plan is to start over again and read them straight through so that I I pick up on everything that I missed reading them as fast as I've been reading them. So you'll 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 get a twofer out of me when I finish the last one. So enjoy them. I oh I am. Thank you so much. And that's all. I'll pass. <laughs> There's so many comments in the sidebar to you, Glynis. One of us, one of us. You're part of the cult now. Welcome to the family. And welcome and enjoy the feeling of still having books to read. So loads of those sort of comments going on in the side. Um Chris Boot has got his hand up and has had right. for some time. So Chris, it's your turn. Hello, Jody. Um, I was thinking, as people have been talking, you've got Jenny and obviously Elizabeth and Max, but then also the male characters. That Have you ever written anyone you don't want to put through the ringer? No. Sorry. <laughs> you are evil. <laughs> One of the, the few advantages to sitting at a desk all day, slowly crippling your back and eating far too much chocolate is the power that you have over your characters. And if I was a nice person, I'd probably let up every now and then and give them a happy time. But I'm just a horrible person um, who's spreading the suffering around. I'm awfully sorry. Um, characters are there to be put through the ringer. And if they they don't suffer how will they not enjoy their happy ending at the time at the end that sounds like a, a definitely a thing you've thought about saying after you've put them through the ringer <laughs> <laughs> yeah um it's 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 a sad character flaw, actually. Now you come to mention it, this feeling of power that you have over your characters and that you can do anything you want to them. I'm not so sure that's been particularly good for me. I was probably a very nice person once upon a time, but not any longer. Actually, that is, you know that Terry told me to read your books before he died. That is actually something more or less that he said. Um, specifically about rinsing but in general what's the point of being an author if you can't make someone else suffer <laughs> sorry can we can we go back to what you just said did did you say terry yeah terry pratchett told me to read your book i'm sure i told you that before no He's, he told a bunch of people i read this thing on amazon no rob downloaded it for him i think so my, my, rob may have read it to him but there's this thing on amazon read it you'll like it that was all he said no wasn't he's he does that he used to do that a bit um and i think it may have been rob downloaded it if you get a chance to talk to him you ask him so yeah that's i was told to read it by terry and i because i've known terry for years i did what he told me you know he told me about things like uh london labor and the london poor and i thought well you know that sounds like a riveting title but it was fantastic henry mayhew's book about london in victorian london astonishing book i would never have known a thousand bits of useless trivia I know if he had if I hadn't read that book. So yeah. I'll take my hand down as well. So okay. he said um, much well that, that's this. me shut up, isn't it? <laughs> well you knew he liked your books. Didn't you? No, I didn't actually. Um oh. uh, somebody once told me that Stephen Moffat had said he enjoyed them and, and I was woo -woo -woo over you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. McDonald likes them, but to, not Terry Pratchett. Stephen oh, Moffat wow. and Joss Whedon and you definitely just enjoy torturing characters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Such fun. There we go. We were in good company then. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. That's, that's, I mean, it's lovely to talk to everybody, but that's really made my night. Me and Terry Pratchett. <laughs> right. Jill Minchin's got her hand up and Cheryl's had her hand up for a bit longer than Jill. Jill, you can put your hand down now. I've got you. You're next. Cheryl first. No, I just wanted to make a comment. I feel like I'm the uh, I'm brain freeze. I'm this uh, American here. So I'm getting all sorts of good things to read from everybody. But uh, how much of your personality have you put, do you think you've put into your characters? Uh, I think I'm attracted to the fact that uh, they're out of sync with the world. And you've mentioned you were a little out of sync in school, which I think might be true of most of us here. Well, 
you're supposed to write about what you know and I don't know anything about being a lovable well-balanced person so none of my characters okay. are lovable well-balanced people I'm afraid okay and this is my question oh and for Glennis I've read everything and I'm rereading them I mean it's almost like reading a diary you I find more things you're yes we write faster I'm sorry six months and you're right <laughs> six hours Thank I'm you experimenting so with voice to text software and it's not going well. Um, I, I tried to download um, the appropriate thing on Windows um, and I don't know what I did, but it all went horribly, horribly wrong to the extent where I had to take my laptop back to the computer shop where even the lovely Steve said he had no idea what I'd managed to do there, but not to do it again. Um, I'm convinced if I could only master voice to text software, then I could treble my output. But so far, um, I spend so much time taking it back to the shop to have whatever I've done undone. It's not working out that well. If anybody's got any bright ideas, I'm really in the market. Right, before we come to Jill, I'm just going to read you a few of these in the sidebar because I, otherwise I can't keep up. Um, Janice said it's such a privilege being able to chat with you, Josie. Her husband's giggling in the background. He has no idea what's going on. Um, Carol said, uh, just to say the writing of Jenny's suicide attempt was brilliant, immediately pulled her into the story. Um, Jane B has said she loved the hospital scene in The Something Girl and Thomas's comments. She cried with laughter reading in bed at 1am and woke her other half up. And I've got another question from Charlie, but I think we need to go to Jill first. Jill, you're up. You need to unmute, darling. Thank you. Am I now unmuted? Yes, I can hear you. Great, thank you. Hello, Jodie. Uh, Hello. In, in Joy to the World, you have this wonderful nativity play where the sheep produces its lamb in the middle. Oh, ever... yes. yes. Is that from your practical experience or was that just wonderful imagination? Having No, I've never through... actually been in a nativity play where that has happened. I was in a rehearsal for a nativity play where the innkeeper threw open the door and said, come in, we have plenty of room um, and, and was removed forthwith. But I've never had a sheep give birth in the middle. I thought it was something Marilyn would enjoy. Yes, because yes, the story was about Marilyn mostly. Yes, but it having been the season of nativity plays and seeing the things that go wrong, I thought that was just wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you. That was another <laughs> lovely story to write as well. Yes, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So I've got a question from Charlie. How easy was it to keep Thomas as the only magical element in the stories and not add in all other kinds of weird and wonderful creatures, happenings? Having typed this, I'm aware that I haven't read the short stories, so if those include leprechauns and sentient mushrooms, please ignore this question. <laughs> um, well, so far, no sentient mushrooms, but that certainly started a train of thought. Um, in Storm Christopher coming out, um, I think they've told me it's April next year. Um, Thomas is not alone, and I'm not going to say any more. Uh, Fee's got her hand up. Ah, on mute is good. Uh, right, regarding Jenny in the stutter, Jodie. <coughs> I mean, you handled it really well. Did you know anybody that had a stutter? Yeah. Yeah. You did? Me. Me. Oh, it was you as well? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, me um, as well. <laughs> not not, not uh, for a long time. Um, but the thing I remember most about it is what a huge physical effort it was even yes. to put together a sentence. My stomach yeah. would kill me at the end. Um, because it honestly felt as if I dredged every word up from the depths somewhere. So yeah. not only do you have 
a stutter and find it difficult to talk, but you're disinclined to talk because it yes. is such an effort. So it's a kind of vicious downward spiral where you say less and less. And when you do speak, you tend to speak in a kind of shorthand to get it out as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, or oh, did you have was... the wait? So somebody Sorry. says to your parents, oh, your child's very quiet. Well, yeah, I am very quiet because I can't say anything. <laughs> Yeah, and mm. people aren't always inclined to wait while you make the effort. No. Either. Um, or worse, finish the sentence for you. Yeah, oh, God, yes, I remember that one. I was the same. Um, yeah. I, was, I came out of it quite well. If I'm very stressed, it still comes back now and again. Every once in a blue moon, where you go, up, uh, uh, uh. but look, I had a really patient dad who just go, breathe. Take your time. You'll get there. Can I stop you a moment? My television's just switched itself on, and that's not scary at all. <laughs> Good God. I think we're coming to the end now, although, Jodie, yeah. we're coming to the end. I've got a couple of questions, but I've also had a question from the lovely female who has asked, can myself, Deb's pick and Charlie have a very quick five minutes with you um, after we finish this so we can talk about something else. Oh, God, am I in trouble again? No, not at all. <laughs> yes. <Okay. So laughs> this last question from Emma. Um, oh, God, I've got another new message. I can't keep up. All right, that's people saying Mr. TV's mysteriously turning on in the next book. <laughs> um, the last questions are, is the Peterson steepling his fingers gesture a bonus Terry Pratchett reference? No, I, are, didn't, I didn't know he did it. Oh, there we go. Um, and are there characters like North and Varma who sort of worm their way through from being minor characters to playing increasingly larger parts? Also, oh. she's got 19 references in Christmas Pie, so she's off to reread it so she can bag the full 26. I think I have plans for Varma. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> ominous there, then. <laughs> so I think that's probably it for everybody else. Have I missed anybody? Could oh, I have just like, only, only one quick one. What she was following about Terry Pratchett, um, it was Charlene Harris that recommended by internet, by her Facebook, um, your books 10 years ago. So you've got a lot of followers wow. in out there. You know, Charlene's obviously True Blood and, and Aurora Teagard yes. and all that. Yeah, it I was think her... I saw the series. Yes. yes, yeah. Well, she was the one that told me about your books. Uh, wow. Right. Yes. Nobody ever tells me anything. I have no idea what's going on outside <laughs> my flat. <laughs> Anyway, that was it. Lovely. Is it wet outside? Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. If everybody except for Deb's pick and Charlie and Fee can poodle off, and obviously not uh, Marianne, because we need you for your Zoom. Don't forget <laughs> to stop recording then.